my Greyhound puppy. She's a little bit bigger than a puppy these days, but I love her near and dear. And she really loves to play. She loves trail running. She likes to travel, loves the open road. And she used to like riding shotgun when she was a little puppy. She grew up a little bit more. And now she really prefers to drive. <laughs> okay? So um, this is a little bit about her. But I want you to think about memory now. Because that's what we study, and that's what I'm going to be talking about. I want you to imagine if you only had memory for those sentences that I said, right? The black and white, just raw information. Juno likes to play. She likes to swim. She's lazy. She travels. She likes the open road. She likes shotgun. She prefers to drive. What if you had only memory for that semantic information, but you didn't have that rich tapestry of the pictures of the event? Would life be very rich and fulfilling? be a little robots running around, Snapchatting with no pictures, right? Yeah, it'd be awful, right? <laughs> yeah, okay, so um, that's kind of my contention. So I study episodic memory, which is our memory for all the episode, the memory of the episode of everything that happened, the rich tapestry, the colors, the who, the what, the where, the when, all stuff that matters, right? You want to remember, not that your child was born, you want to remember the actual episode I mean, ladies, maybe not so much, you might want to forget that. But that's still a near and dear moment in your heart, right? I mean, that's your child, that's a special moment. Uh, you know, so, so that's what we focus on. And so the question that's sort of the central focus of our lab's research is sort of three points, which is basically, how do these episodic memories operate, and why do they fail sometimes? Um, secondly, how do we improve that memory performance for those episodic memories? And also see ways to maybe prevent the decline of those, because I don't know about you, but my episodic memory fails all the freaking time. And we want to prevent that. And I'm not even that old. When I get old, it's going to go downhill real fast. Right? We want to prevent that. Um, now, we, the last thing we kind of ask then in relation to that is that are there brain states that can be associated with this enhanced concept of cognition? If we can find ways to bump that up. So that's kind of what I'll share with you a little bit. Some snapshots about some of the research findings that we've had. And uh, there'll be overview summaries, and, and then we'll kind of move into the NASA thing. Um, and so when I do that, kind of the connection between what I do, and that will connect with what we do with NASA, is we'll see that we share small, multiple methodologies. That is, ways that scientists, both here at CSUSB, or at UC Davis, or at NASA, have available to take a snapshot of what's happening in the brain in order to understand our cognition and our psychology. So there's three main forms that we use. One is electrophysiology, which is basically you can record the electrical activity from coming from the scalp using various different electrodes. You'll see abbreviated as EEG. But when we average it, it'll be called event-related potentials, or ERPs. And you'll see it can be looked like this in some of the data I'll show, some graphs. Or you can plot it in color maps based on the onset of a stimulus and the time of how that activity changes after the stimulus. Okie dokie. Now the other thing we can do is take a look at it, plot it on where it happens on the head. So if you see this, this is a nose in the middle, looking down from a bird's eye view, you have a left ear and a right ear. So put the left ear in, you take the right ear out, the nose in, you shake it on the Okay, so, uh, so that's EEG. The other thing that we'll do a little bit is look at neuropsychology. So we'll look at deficits that can happen to, due to brain damage. So we talked about this a little bit last time. We talked about being able to make some inferences on what brain areas might do or what might be happening based on deficits you observe after damage to certain areas. Now I can very thankfully say that I don't think we had any brain damage put to us in NASA, um, but you guys have to see how I teach the rest of the semester and get, give me a second opinion on that. Um, maybe, you'll, maybe you'll think they gave me some brain damage, but we didn't actually use that method. I'll talk about it in some, in some data. Uh, and finally, we'll talk about some neuroimaging, which is fMRI, which is basically, instead of looking at really, really fast millisecond activity, that can look at the scalp location of, of brain stuff. Instead, we're going to put someone in an MRI machine. What it's really good at is taking an inside view of a three-dimensional snapshot of the brain. So this is a little bit slower time measurements, but you can look three-dimensionally. Here, you can look two-dimensionally on the scalp, on the surface, but you can look much faster. And they're complementary methods that I use in research, that other researchers use, and that NASA is using as too. As well. So I want to introduce you to that, so you kind of know what we'll be talking about. Um, now, there's two big things to know about memory, that uh, sort of a good background permit that the field is kind of agreed upon. One, is that memory seems to be based upon stimulus-response relationships. 
So anybody who knows about Pavlov's dogs, you remember our old friend Ivan Pavlov? He rang the little bell, and the dog began to drool. Okay? So you get the drooling dog. I need to replace that with Juno's picture, I think. She's, <laughs> she's cuter, but she drools less. Um, but anyways, and we can see that that was a huge driving force in the field, led to operant conditioning, behaviorism, classical conditioning, huge part of psychology, understanding of memory, right? Is that memory is a function of a response to a stimulus, yeah? We'll talk about that, because I'm going to challenge that dogma. Then we'll also talk about the second thing, which is that long-term memory in the brain depends critically upon an area called the medial temporal lobes, and particularly an area called the hippocampus. Just kind of buried deep in there, in the middle part of the brain. Okay? Now, that sort of famous model has come about based on damage we, that we, excuse me, damage that we have observed, such that it's given us this canonical model that says there's two different kinds of memory, conscious and non-conscious, and the conscious memory relies upon the hippocampus, but if you have damage to the hippocampus, that your non-conscious memory is perfectly fine, because you can do that just just right. So it's given us this division that non-conscious memory relies upon other areas, but not the hippocampus. And I'm going to try to shoot an arrow through both of these core pillars of the field. So I'm going to challenge conventional wisdom. All right. And I'm going to see if you guys are persuaded by the time we're done. All right. So let's talk about that a little bit. The best textbooks all agree, right? Here's the thing, right? That non-conscious implicit memory, it does not depend upon the medial temporal lobes. This is told to us in the huge, thick Bible of the neuroscience. It feels like this thick. It's called The Principles of Neuroscience. It's written by this guy who won the Nobel Prize for neuroscience and memory that he worked on. And it says, it does not depend on the medial temporal lobes, our non-conscious memory. Okay? And it's not just him. It's also books by Gazzaniga, all these other really famous textbook writers and leaders of the field. Very common finding. But I want to suggest something, and it is the idea that what if we've been looking at a three-dimensional world with two-dimensional glasses? All right? What I mean by that is what if we're looking at something in data, but we're only using maybe two methods, when maybe three methods might help? All right? And I'll elaborate upon that as we go a little further, um, because I'm going to ask what if the hippocampus actually could be found to support our non-conscious memories as well? Maybe it doesn't, but why don't we look and find out? Okay, so it turns out that there actually is a hint of there being more to that story than what the textbooks had traditionally been alluding to. So, um, work actually by Wei Chung Wang, who was in my lab at UC Davis, he's a good, good friend of, and an alumni from Davis, he found in 2010 that the medial temporal lobe can be sensitive to the status of items that we study, whether it's old or new, outside of our conscious awareness. Really interesting. But it wasn't the hippocampus. It was a bigger area in the medial temporal lobe. So it wasn't quite the hippocampus. Now, we also found <coughs> evidence from Debbie Hanula, who I was actually fortunate enough to learn from because she was a postdoctoral scientist when I was just a little baby grad student at Davis. And she used uh, eye tracking studies in patients with hippocampal lesions and found that the hippocampus did support signs of implicit memory, but it was generally associations. So uh, it wasn't real clear, at least to me, whether it could be the associative role of the hippocampus that's very well known, that was active for that finding, or whether it was um, single item memory. And that remained untested. And so the suggestion that I want to make is that maybe these behavioral and MRI methods might not be sensitive enough to detect the subtlest forms of human cognition, which is the unconscious mind. And so if you want to test with three measures, behavior, brain damage, and physiology, that would be a good way to do it. But the problem was, was that nobody had collected physiology of these implicit memory patients uh, who had had hippocampal selective damage. And the main reason for that was because, frankly, it's hard. It's really tough to do. It's hard to find patients. It's hard to get good data with low sample sizes. Um, and we ended up only getting three patients who had selective hippocampal damage. But um, you'll see that they were pretty powerful uh, data points. Um, and so from that, it, I, I just wanted to, you know, given the, 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 the nature of our talk about space today, right, this wasn't collected because it's hard. But we landed on the moon because John F. Kennedy made a famous speech where he said, you know, we choose to go to the moon, not because it is easy, but because it is hard. 
And so that was something that I was always drawn to, is doing things that are hard because they are hard. And anybody who will know me, uh, Davis, tomorrow, knows that it was hard because we had a lot of setbacks. We had a lot of failures in five years it took to test three people. All right? You hate your life a lot during those times. So a couple points, okay? Um, so it's tough, but we want to do it. And so I want to suggest, what if that hippocampus is playing a more fundamental role in non-conscious memory, maybe even a role that's necessary for it? So the question is, how do you capture non-conscious memories if you give these patients a conscious memory task? And I'll suggest to you that the answer is the same way that porcupines mate. Which is very careful. Man, <laughs> think about it. Right. Yeah. Okay, so creatively and carefully. What we'll do is we'll look for brain activity, and what you do is you compare the brain activity for when people say they don't remember, okay, this red line, okay, and you compare it to the time when they also say they don't remember, but this time they're right. It really is a new item. So their conscious experience is identical. That is, they don't have any conscious experience of that memory. But anywhere like this, where there's a difference between that biological signal means that something in the brain is remembering, even though the mind has forgotten. And that's the strategy we'll use. This is data from what other people have shown in 98, showing this effect in this back area of the scalp. So I'm going to orient you to focus on the timing of this, which is about 400 milliseconds. And the physiology is important with that precision, but really, we're going to look for this posterior area of activity that people have found in other areas, and look to see if it's there in patients without a hippocampus. And when we do that, what we see is a really profound pattern of effects. It's very surprising. In our healthy, normal controls, we see that beautiful back posterior parietal activity just like we saw in that Nobel Prize winner's textbook. But when you look at people who don't have a hippocampus, this is that huge hole in there, you have a massive deficit. It actually goes south. And if you want to look at the, the actual brain waves for that, this looks a lot like our last slide. But here, our old items in black are going much further south. So it's really quite surprising, and it wasn't driven by one patient or two or an outlier. We can see here, this is the data point for all three of our patients. It's really quite substantial from controls and quantified by a reliable condition by group interaction in our 2 by 2 ANOVA. So it's really pretty powerful findings suggesting that basically the hippocampus was impaired for implicit memory and that uh, our non-conscious memory might be relying upon our same neural structures but functioning in different ways such that a form of non-declarative memory seems to depend upon this hippocampus that it's not supposed to, because all the models say it doesn't. But maybe they're wrong. Um, so, uh, it seems that hippocampal damage seems to rewire the ways in which our old and new items are differentiated before awareness occurs. And so, maybe it blows up that model and might, uh, might need some revision. So that was a pretty cool finding we had. Uh, and it led us to ask some other questions about things that might be happening in memory beyond our conscious awareness, particularly the brain states. So this is kind of like the part of the talk I started off with, talking about brain states for performance. And going all the way back to Descartes, which you guys are all experts on right now, because we talked about that last class, right? He's a, we got this idea that stimulus comes in and leads to a response. We have a stimulus of a bell, a response in Pavlovian conditioning, and even in neuroimaging, we've always modeled all of our neuroscience data of memory as a response of brain activity to a given stimulus. But studies of attention and um, uh, sensation, particularly uh, led by a lot of people at like Davis as well, Steve Vlog, Ali Mazahiri, uh, Jesse Bankson, They've done great work suggesting that that uh, neural state before the stimulus actually influences if and how somebody processes it. So we wanted to ask if that same principle of brain states can affect memory too. When we were at Davis, that's exactly what we did find. We found that this is stimulus onset, and there was a big pattern of theta frequency. There was much more bigger brain activity before stimulus happened that predicted and by the way, it was located in the sort of frontal, left temporal, parietal area of the brain. The bigger that this effect was, it predicted how good people's actual memory scores were later on once they were tested on memory. So it's pretty, pretty remarkable. Um, we were surprised, very pleased. And so we did some follow-up studies asking what structures in the brain with MRI might be supporting that. So that's kind of what we did as a follow-up. We put them in that MRI. And we asked them to study pairs of information, either two words or two pictures. And we gave them this cue 
pre-stimulus, and we wanted to know if brain activity here predicted how well they learned this information. So I'll show you a sort of a summary of that. And it turns out it absolutely did. There are two kinds of activity patterns. One was deep in the brain in this hippocampus, and the other was way on the top, sort of right frontal cortex area. Okay. Now both of them actually negatively predicted memory, so that the bigger the effect was of brain activity, the worse you did. And I said, what the heck? This is really confusing. So we didn't know what to do, because we were correlating the size of this pre-stimulus effect with our measure of performance, which is the probability of a hit minus the probability of a false alarm. And they both came out in a multiple regression analysis as being independently accounting for separate variants. What that means is that these are different effects. This is not the same as this. This is not the same as this. And I threw my hands up and I went home and I said, what the heck do we make of that? And I thought about something. We said, we're correlating these two things to this metric of these two measurements. Why don't we separate these and take a look? And that's exactly what we did. So when you just look at the measurements of a memory hit, which is successful memory, it turns out the cortex doesn't care at all. But the hippocampus sure does. That's a big negative relationship. So the bigger the hippocampal effect, the worse likely you are to have a successful memory. But not for the cortex. But check this out. In the cortex, it really hugely cared about the size of the brain activity. Because the bigger that brain activity was, the more likely you were to make a false memory, a false alarm, an FA. Which is totally not true in the hippocampus. Flat line. So this had never been done before as, a, as an analytic technique to understand brain behavior relationships in this regard by breaking down this metric that everyone's always collapsed together. Well, it turns out when you break it down, you can find out things are happening in really different ways in different parts of the brain. That was really cool. So that's kind of what we found there. Um, let's skip over this because I sort of summarized that. But the idea is we think that the cortex is more active during these false alarms because it's only remembering one item in a pair. So you're, seeing, you're asked, hey, do you remember this pair? And you see one of them and you're like, yeah, I remember that thing. And so you think you saw the pair, even though it's a different pair. And so it leads to a false memory. Um, so you kind of lead someone halfway there and they say, oh, yeah, sure. And they make the conclusion. That's wrong. So um, it seems that our brain states prior to learning can predict both if and how the information is later remembered. And so uh, sort of summarize these brain states, we can see that, that both if and how a person will remember is kind of the, 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 the interesting take home point there. It can be both uh, in the cortex and the hippocampus. So this is the first uh, cortical pre-stem effects that had been seen. Um, they can be both helpful and hurtful to memory. So it can make your memory better or it can make your memory worse. And we think that the, be the beneficial effects are re reflecting basically uh, Better network optimization, better network communication among cells to support basically completion of the patterns that the, the neural networks are working with. Um, and we think maybe the deleterious or the, the negative effects could reflect distraction that's happening in coding, such that the more distracted you are, you're going to have more brain activity happening because you're distracted, and you're going to do less on memory, which seems to be a pretty viable account. We have some follow-up data. It turns out when we we made some manipulations. We actually found that that was the case, but I'll save that for another talk. Um, and the stuff that we're kind of following up with, uh, actually, Brooke Roberts just published this here with Charn at Davis just a few weeks ago, and they did manipulations because it gives us a target for interventions to improve performance. And that's exactly what they did. They manipulated brain activity using this cognitive entrainment method of this visual flicker. So you just put these goggles on, it gives you certain entrainment frequency for the brain. And it turns out the people who got that scored better in memory than the people who didn't. That just came out a few weeks ago. I was lucky enough to be an author on it with them. Um, but they did all the heavy lifting and all the hard work. And uh, it was really an honor just to see the process that they, that they did. So, um, so that just came out. So it suggests that these stimulus response models, a stimulus and response, might actually be an incomplete account of the factors that are supporting our learning and memory. So, these targets for intervention for improving performance. Okay, so from this point, as a psychologist, 